you know, there was a time in Mississippi when you know, the majority of Mississippians, in fact, the vast preponderance of Mississippians, earned their living directly through agriculture. I mean, go back to 1930, which is not that far away, and it's, it's something like, you know, 70% of Mississippi's population directly involved in tilling the soil. And now in Mississippi, it's, I think it's about 4%. You know, for, even though many of us have family stories about the farm, you know, grandmother, or, you know, or even have a place, you know, um, where that, that used to be farmed or maybe it's rented out or is in trees or what have you, you know, we, we no longer are directly involved in that activity. But, you know, that's a, that's a powerful phenomenon. That's a powerful set of stories that we need to preserve. So getting your students out, for example, and just interviewing people who did work on farms. You know, what, what did you do? You know, how did, you know, what did you grow? How did you grow it? Uh, how did you cook your food, you know, before you had power, before you had gas? Those kinds of things. Um, that's important, and it's a great way for students to get out there and into the community and interact with people. Um, so the community-based oral history projects are really powerful, and the school classroom is a great way to launch it. Um, and I've got some examples. Um, other ideas, local institutional history. You know, maybe there's a, a you know, your community hospital uh, had, uh, in doing a history of your local hospital or local churches. You know, churches have, have histories. Uh, there's stories there. Uh, community centers. Uh, you know, uh, maybe there's an arts organization in your town. So that's going to have history. And so you find the leaders, talk to them. So schools, churches, community organizations, arts groups, even businesses. You know, um, we did a project last year with some folks in Natchez. So the, the river flooded. It was pretty bad in Natchez. It was really hot. And there's a lumber company down there on the, low, on the river. And it's been there for about 140 years. You know, they flooded before, but it was an opportunity to do an oral history of this lumber company, in addition to uh, interviewing people about their experiences with the flood. And there were some terrific stories related to the history of the lumber company, and they got those by interviewing the guy that ran the lumber company and then his aged uncle, and you know, just going around to people that were attached to the company. And you can get some really um, important stories about, you know, our common life here. Let's listen a little bit. Um, and hear what, what people have to say. Because the, the key to oral history is listening. People think, I don't know what questions to ask. What do I ask? You got two of these. Not just one of these. You know, keep that in mind. Here, here's some, here are some examples of, of what I was talking about. I just listen to these. This is a woman who was in the Women's Auxiliary Corps in World War II. So she was a woman in the military, and she talks about her experience. And, and she has within her story, her judgment, her explanation about her experience in World War II. We ran, uh, ran into a lot of uh, negative attitudes about women in the military, uh, which still exists. Uh, I have been just absolutely insulted to my face in uh, fairly recent years. Uh, by both men and women that think it's just awful that, uh, you know, what kind of slut are you that you would do that? You did it to be where the men were. Well, we've heard a lot of that. And uh, my reply generally is, well, what did you do to help win the war? And <clears throat> particularly, it would be a woman that did nothing. That's, I mean, that's a powerful judgment. You know, I mean, that's her perspective, but, you know, that's, that's a complete explanation. She's got a little theory. If you think of it that way, she's got a theory of women in, in military service. Not, it might not hold up. You know, there's going to be other stories, many stories, but that's her story, and that's her experience. Here's one. This is, um, there's a, uh, some of you may be familiar with Willie Morris. He was a great Mississippi writer. He was a boy wonder of journalism, editor of Harper's, and wrote uh, a number of good novels and, Great, great memoir. Here, this is him um, remembering his college days. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and so he was in Oxford uh, for that Rhodes Scholarship. And he picks up a poet, uh, Robert Frost, a very famous American poet, and he talks about him and Robert Frost's view of Mississippi. 
right now because he's such a great yeah. storyteller, yeah. but that's, that's terrifying. Uh, Gulf Side is a. Uh, you might be familiar with Gulf Side Assembly in in Wayland. Um, the buildings, of course, like everything else in Wayland, washed away Katrina, but uh, was a significant site, uh, historical site. And they're rebuilding it, so we'll see what. But it was um, one of the few, like he said, one of the few places on the beach that were were open to everybody. Um, yeah. Here's some of the things that oral history is not good at. We call episodic memory. You know, where were you on the night of October 15th? You know, 2003. You know, details like that, which are better established through documents and, and things like that. That stuff, that's not so good. You know, you don't want to go into an oral history trying to ascertain kind of that kind of level of kind of objective mini fact. What is really good is the kinds of stuff we've, we've just heard. The kind of emotional memory, which is very strong. People do remember how they they feel in intense events, like Mr. Spearman. You can remember that. Uh, uh, you know, their judgments, their perspectives, those are the things that are all history is really good for. It's also really good for um, those that are and more interested in kind of a scholarly approach uh, after uh, uh, documenting networks, particularly in social movements. You know, so you ask people, well, you know, who did you work with? You know, and 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 piece together the kind of web of interconnectedness because you know we're not you know individuals in this. I mean, we're individuals, but we're not you know, sole solitary actors. You know, as we move through life, we're social beings, and in uh, organizations like the civil rights movement. And the anti-civil rights movement, there are networks of people, and understanding those networks are really important. That's more of something that scholars right now are deeply interested in, and I also personally find fascinating. Let's just listen. Let's just listen to more of these interviews, because these are powerful stories. Um, we're approaching the anniversary of uh, James Meredith's uh, matriculation at Ole Miss. Um, Listen to, let's listen to what Mr. Meredith had to say. These are two clips where he talks about his approach during the integration crisis in 1962 in Oxford. I applied for admission to the University of Mississippi. Within a week, I had written to the federal government telling them how to respond. Oh, yeah. Telling them. Uh, what I was doing and what to expect. I mean, I, I told them that uh, that they would uh, try to eliminate me as they eliminated everybody else. And I also said in the letter, which uh, is still in the Kennedy Library, that I had no desire to be eliminated. I wanted to be living uh, 60 years from then, just like I was living before I sent the letter. I mean, to uh, old medicine. So I did all my communicating with all of them through the media. I mean, they, uh, uh, I never have had a conversation with the enemy. And basically, I consider all white folks in the See, most people are ironed by that. But I lived in Canada with just as much white supremacy as by that. So, I mean, they, uh, uh, so I kept my eye on all of them, and all of my communication with all of them was through the media. I mean, uh, uh, I had never see all the other blacks like Kennard and uh, got trapped. They, the, the president of the university invited them to come to them to make application. When they came out, the police arrested them. Right. And the one up at Old Miss, when he came out, and took him to the insane side. All right. So I never talked to the enemy without the public as a witness. Never once. What do you, what do you make of that? It's a tactical thing. Yeah. yeah. Smart guy. Uh, they, yeah, they might know what happened to Clyde Kennard. He was the first man to apply to the 
apply to all males. I'm not sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to put in a frame, chicken seed, and alcohol. Yeah, he's arrested. And he died. From cancer? He was in his